During the First World War, over 2,000 professional footballers from Britain volunteered to serve their country. Hundreds formed the core of their own PALS battalions, and they inspired thousands of fans to join them too. Many of these working-class sportsmen eventually became officers. Many were decorated for valour, with two receiving the Victoria Cross, and 364 made the ultimate sacrifice, laying down their lives for their country. This is the story of both those football battalions and some of the footballers who left the playing fields to fight on the battlefields. The outbreak of the First World War in August 1914 presented the United Kingdom with a significant manpower shortage. The British Expeditionary Force of nearly a quarter of a million men might sound large, but was only about a third of what both her ally, France, and her main enemy, Germany, could immediately put in the field. Within a month, Germany's war machine had cranked into gear and over three million Germans were in uniform. Within days of the outbreak, the Secretary of State for War, Field Marshal Lord Kitchener, appealed for 100,000 volunteers to immediately sign up. Such was the patriotic fervour that by the end of September 1914, just over seven weeks after the war had been declared, over 750,000 men had volunteered for active service. Many of these volunteers formed the famous PALS battalions, drawn from individual towns. An incredible sense of, we're in it together, mates going to war. But there are other, lesser known PALS battalions, drawn not from towns and cities, where whole communities would remember them, but from work professions. Over 1,600 London stockbrokers formed the 10th Battalion Royal Fusiliers, whilst two whole battalions of the Northumberland Fusiliers were recruited from employees of the North East Railway Company. But the war and this recruitment drive presented a problem to the Football Association, and in particular to the professional clubs in the Football League. With the new season just weeks away, what should they do? Should they play their part by releasing their players for the recruitment drive? But how would they then fulfil their fixtures, especially as there were no plans to cancel the season? And what about the fans? Was the club's duty to abandon the game, or help entertain working people and raise morale on the home front? That was certainly the opinion of the chairman of the FA, Charles Clegg. The two professional leagues in England, the Football League and the Southern League, agreed with him. They also argued that as their players were locked into one-year contracts, the players could not enlist without technically breaking their contract. And likewise, if they simply released their players, those players could argue they were owed next season's pay. The FA and club's arguments cut little ice with many in the population. Professional clubs were accused of not playing the game and the Dean of Lincoln Cathedral contend them for putting commercial interests ahead of the war effort. Cricket legend W.G. Grace and the creator of Sherlock Holmes, Arthur Conan Doyle, were also among the voices urging the football authorities to suspend operations. East End brewer and social reformer Frederick Charrington went further, castigating his local club, West Ham United, a member of the Southern League at the time, for their stance, and calling their actions both German and cowardly. The professional club stance was not helped by the fact that the county cricket championship had been suspended with immediate effect upon the declaration of war, despite the fact there were only three matches left in their season. Rugby authorities followed suit, as did England's amateur football clubs. The professional football clubs were out on a limb. The soul-searching reached to the very top of government, where the Prime Minister was asked in the House of Commons to intervene and force the leagues to suspend the forthcoming season. But the government did nothing and the FA and the leagues went about their business as usual. And thus, on the 1st of September, the 1914-15 season kicked off, with Blackburn Rovers defending their title. But the controversy would not go away. In November, the press rounded on the clubs, deciding not to publish any football stories, except for a summary of the results. Up in Scotland, Liberal Member of Parliament Sir George McRae took his own action, urging footballers to form a volunteer PALS battalion. The first and reserve teams of Edinburgh Club, Heart of Midlothian, stepped forward and joined en masse. Their example motivated staff members, directors and 500 supporters of the club to enlist too. Swiftly, the Hearts players were joined by professional players from other Scottish clubs, Wraith Rovers, Falkirk, Dunfermline, Kilmarnock and local rivals Hibernian. 150 Hibernian supporters also joined up to serve alongside their sporting heroes. McRae's battalion became the 16th, 2nd Edinburgh, Battalion of the Royal Scots. Seven Hearts players were to die serving with the battalion on the Western Front, three of them on the first day of the Battle of the Somme. And a memorial to their sacrifice is now a famous landmark in Haymarket, Edinburgh.
McRae's example in Scotland galvanised action and opinion down in England. But before I go on, if you enjoy my work, then sign up for my free weekly newsletter so you don't miss my latest releases. There's a link in the description. Anyway, back to the story. Less than a month after McRae had formed his battalion in Scotland, there was finally action in England. On the 8th of December 1914, with the season in full swing, another Member of Parliament, William Johnson Hicks, invited the 11 professional clubs in the London area to a meeting to discuss the possibility of emulating the Hearts players by forming their own Pals Battalion. A follow-up meeting was held a week later on the 15th of December at Fulham Town Hall. Once more chaired by Johnson Hicks, it was unanimously agreed to form a Pals Battalion consisting of footballers and their supporters. The 17th Battalion Middlesex Regiment was immediately formed. It was known as the Footballers Battalion. 35 professional footballers signed up on the spot at Fulham Town Hall. The first in line was England international Frank Buckley. 32-year-old Buckley had previously been in the army, joining to serve in the Boer War, but ending up in Ireland instead. With no excitement of active service, he brought himself out in 1902 and concentrated on his football career, playing 92 times at Derby County and representing England in a shock 1-0 defeat to Ireland in 1914. Due to his previous military experience and on-field leadership skills, he was immediately commissioned and eventually rose to the rank of Major. By March 1915, there were 122 professional players in the battalion, including the whole team of Clapton, now Leighton, Orient. The example set by the players inspired a further 1,350 volunteers to join them in the 17th Battalion, the Middlesex Regiment. This success led to the Middlesex Regiment establishing another footballers' battalion, the 23rd Service Battalion, in June 1915. In command of this second battalion was former Tottenham and Clapton Orient player Alan Haig Brown. Like Buckley, Haig Brown rose to the rank of Major and was awarded the Distinguished Service Order, DSO. He was killed attacking a German machine gun position during the Germans' last big offensive in the spring of 1918. The original battalion was to go into action during the Battle of the Somme in 1916. As part of the 2nd Infantry Division, they fought at the Battle of Gilmore and Delville Wood. And it was here that William Jonas of Clapton Orient made the ultimate sacrifice. Despite being married, the 27-year-old was the pin-up boy of Clapton Orient, attracting scores of female admirers. Eventually, he had to take out an advert in the matchday programme, asking for his fan club to stop sending letters to him. On the 27th of July 1916, during the Battle of Delville Wood, he found himself pinned down in a trench with fellow Clapton Orient player Richard McFadden. Eventually, he told McFadden he'd had enough of being pinned down and leapt out of the trench towards the Germans. It was the last time his teammates saw him. McFadden, who was later promoted to Colour Sergeant Major and who had received the military medal, was himself killed that October. Other professional players to die serving with the football battalion at the Somme included a third Clapton Orient player, George Scott, as well as Stockport County's Sergeant Norman Wood, former Aston Villa player Billy Gerrish, and former England international Evelyn Lintot. It was during the Battle of the Somme that Major Frank Buckley was wounded by shrapnel and command passed to another former professional footballer, Captain Edward Inkerman Bell. <laughs> now, as you might have guessed by that middle name, his father was an army major. Bell, who was by now 30 years old, had played in the past for Southampton. During this battle, he personally rescued some stranded men from a dugout for which he received the military cross. He was killed in action in 1918 on the Western Front. Meanwhile, the other football battalion, the 23rd Middlesex, were also in action at the Battle of the Somme. Amongst their number was a professional footballer from the Southern League side, Northampton Town. Walter Tull, born in Folkestone, Kent in 1888, was of mixed heritage. His father was a carpenter, originally from Barbados. His mother was a white local from Kent. He played for Clapton Orient and then Tottenham Hotspur, and then he transferred to Northampton Town and made over 100 appearances under the legendary future Huddersfield and Arsenal manager, Herbert Chapman. Enlisting in the football battalion shortly after it was formed in December 1914, he was swiftly promoted to sergeant by his commanding officer, Frank Buckley. Having survived the Battle of the Somme, he was commissioned as a second lieutenant, in contravention of the 1914 Manual of Military Law forbidding the commissioning of non-white officers. And thus, Walter Tull of Northampton Town FC became the first non-white officer in the history of the British Army. 
After the Somme, Walter Tull fought with the 23rd Battalion on the Italian front, surviving a gas attack, before once more ending up on the Western Front. It was here on the 28th of March 1918 that he was killed, leading his men towards the German lines. His body was never found. Despite the formation of two footballers' battalions in England, somehow the 1914-15 football season continued to completion, with Everton winning the first division and Derby County topping the second. On the 29th of April 1915, the season drew to a close with the FA Cup final. Held at Old Trafford, the 50,000 crowd was well down on the peacetime 72,000 of the previous year, and many of those attending were on leave from the forces, earning the match the nickname the Khaki Final. Those present saw Sheffield United beat Chelsea 3-0. With the season completed, the FA, along with the Football League and the Southern League, now suspended their competitions until the end of the war. Whilst the opportunity for winning medals on the pitch was no longer possible, many of the players in the footballers' battalions and elsewhere were to receive medals for their valour instead. It's also interesting to see just how many of the footballers were promoted and how many of them became officers. It seems that sports field leadership transferred to battlefield leadership. An example is Joe Bailey. Before the war, Bailey had played for Reading, where during his 186 appearances, he was nicknamed Bubbles. An accomplished all-round sportsman, he'd previously played football for Nottingham Forest, as well as representing Berkshire at cricket and his native Oxfordshire at hockey. He was 35 when he enlisted. By 1917, Bubbles Bailey was yet another footballer who'd been commissioned. During the war, he was awarded the Distinguished Service Order, the DSO, and the Military Cross, which he'd actually received three times. Meanwhile, Percy Barnfather also rose from the ranks to become an officer, in his case a captain, and he was also awarded a medal for valour, the Military Cross. Born in Biker, Newcastle-upon-Tyne, he had before the war played for Southern League Croydon Common. Now, if you haven't heard of them, that's probably not surprising. They were the only club who participated in the Football League and Southern League in that 1914-15 season, who never reformed after the war. It's estimated that something like 2,000 professional footballers from clubs in England, Wales and Scotland served during the First World War. Not all of them served in the football battalions of the 17th and 23rd Middlesex or the 16th Royal Scots. Even before the controversy of whether the season should be played or not, and long before the formation of the football battalion, Donald Bell of Bradford Park Avenue was credited as the first professional player to enlist. He was commissioned the following year, shortly before being killed as he tried to single-handedly storm a German machine gun nest armed with hand grenades. For his action, he received a posthumous Victoria Cross. And he wasn't the only professional footballer to receive the VC. Nor was he the first. Just a month earlier, William Angus, a Scottish player who'd been on the books at Glasgow Celtic, was awarded Britain's highest medal for valour too. Whilst playing as a footballer, he was also a member of the Territorial Army, the British Army Reserve, and thus had already been called up and was serving in the Highland Light Infantry by the time McRae's football battalion had been formed. During an attack on the German lines on the 12th of June 1915, he saw one of his comrades lying injured in no man's land. Angus ventured out and attached a rope to the man so he could be pulled back to the safety of the British trenches. The Germans, however, spotted him and opened fire, making escape impossible. In an effort to draw their fire away from the wounded soldier, Angus broke cover and ran in the opposite direction. The ruse worked, and as the Germans fired at the footballer, his comrade was pulled back to safety. Angus also survived the incident, but the Scottish footballer lost his left eye and part of his right foot. His commanding officer noted, No braver deed was ever done in the history of the British Army. 346 professional footballers died in the First World War. Many others, like William Angus VC, carried injuries that prevented them playing when peace returned. Fred Bullock, the captain of Huddersfield Town with 202 appearances for his club, returned suffering from the effects of ammonia inhalation from a gas attack. He never played again and died in 1922. Before the war, Joe Mercer had enjoyed a promising career at Nottingham Forest. He enlisted in the Footballers' Battalion on the day it was founded in December 1914. Rising to the rank of sergeant, he'd been injured in the head, the shoulder and the leg and had ended up in a German POW camp. He never played again and died once more from the effects of gas inhalation in 1927. His son, also called Joe Mercer, 
would go on to manage Manchester City in the 1960s and 70s. The shrapnel wound suffered by Major Frank Buckley at the Battle of the Somme punctured his lung and ended any hope he had of resuming his playing career at the end of the war. Instead, he embarked upon a football management career that was to span 36 years, ending at Leeds in 1956. From 1927 to 1944, he was the manager of Wolverhampton Wanderers, where he mentored and then promoted to club captain, the Wolves legend, Stan Cullis. As I said earlier, the football battalions were not solely made up of footballers. Other sportsmen joined their ranks, such as the Scottish international rugby player, John Dallas, who joined and was killed fighting with McRae's battalion. Actually, the majority of the men in the battalions were simply ordinary men who'd been inspired to fight alongside their sporting heroes. And between them, they paid a huge price. The football battalion of the 17th Middlesex lost over 1,000 men by the end of the First World War. In 2010, a memorial to the men who died fighting for the battalion was unveiled in France. Nowadays, every week during the football season, millions tune in to watch matches on TV and hundreds of thousands actually attend games. Most players and supporters don't realise that they're walking in the steps of giants. A moment in history when supporters joined their heroes, charging across no man's land towards the enemy, and when professional footballers exchanged the sports field for the battlefield, where they showed courage and leadership, and many made the ultimate sacrifice for their country. It's a story that football fans should be told, should remember, and should be very proud of. Thanks for joining me today, and please check out my other videos, including the First World War story of the Liverpool Doctor, who was awarded the Victoria Cross not once, but twice, Noel Shabazz. And if you enjoy my work, please consider becoming a supporter. Click on the links appearing now and in the description. And thanks to Harry, Peter, Dalton, and Dom for your support already. Thanks for watching, keep well, and I'll see you again very soon.